Hi, I'm Gerald Johnson, Executive Vice President of Global Manufacturing and Sustainability for General Motors. And welcome back to the Competitive Advantage. 2022 has been a tremendous year for us in manufacturing, including multiple new vehicle reveals and major investments in our team and our facilities across the globe. On this episode of the Competitive Advantage, we will hear from Omar Vargas, Vice President and Head of Global Public Policy at General Motors. He's going to talk to us about the role of our policy team in supporting our manufacturing team, the transition to EVs, and our manufacturing supply chain. Thanks for tuning in, and I hope you enjoy the conversation. Welcome, Omar. Uh, good to have you with us on the Competitive Advantage. Uh, you're reasonably new to General Motors, so why don't you take a moment and introduce yourself to the entire team here and tell us a little bit about Omar. Sure, Gerald, happy to, and, and thank you for having me here on the Competitive Advantage. Uh, 14 months with the company, it's been fabulous and fantastic. I've learned a lot and have run very quickly in this first year here. I've been in government affairs in the corporate sector for, uh, well, and in government, gosh, about 25 years. Uh, super excited, have learned a great deal over the past 14 months. It's been great working with you thus far. We've already spent a fair amount of time together. Look forward to doing more great stuff like Absolutely. investments uh, around our footprint in our, our communities. So let's jump in a little bit though. The public policy team, and many people may not understand how public policy works in concert with or hand in hand with manufacturing and how that all comes together. Can you tell us a little bit about what you and your team do and how it affects manufacturing? Sure, Gerald, and I uh, thank you and, and uh, our colleagues in manufacturing uh, across the board, especially our plant uh, teams, our plant leadership teams. Operations in 27 states, 90,000 employees. That's a big footprint. That's really important to government, whether at the state and local level or to the federal government. And uh, when we're working together in our communities around the plants and in demonstrating our manufacturing footprint, our investment in the United States, our capabilities, our innovation, the whole package. We show up importantly with government uh, and elected officials see how much we're contributing to American society, the fabric of our communities, and that in turn helps to ensure that we have a good relationship to advocate for the policies that matter most to the company. And so really important, and I'll take a moment to shout out to all of our government officials, whether we're talking federal, state, mayors, uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce, uh, their engagement with our manufacturing facilities has always been strong and we hope to keep it that way. Can you elaborate on what smart policies look like and, and how they come to play in, uh, in these conversations and interactions with government support? I love that phrase, smart policies, because um, that's at our core, what we want to encourage is really good public policy decisions. And, and we do that in collaboration with, with our legislators and, and government officials. And sometimes there's back and forth and we have to compromise, but as long as we're driving for what's in the best interest of the public, uh, we know we're gonna land in the right spot. What's critically important is that we're working with government on EV consumer incentives, incentives for investments in manufacturing, and of course, workforce development. Uh, and then related with EV sort of incentives would be the infrastructure support, which all drives at a public-private partnership. Government's not going to be able to do it alone. Industry can't do it alone. But together, we can do it on a very fast timetable that will have a beneficial impact on our communities and society at large. So when we talk about smart policies, we're talking about those policies that help enable the transformation path that we're on and help to enable the vision that we have of zero crashes, zero emissions, and zero congestion. So let's get into the recent news around Inflation Reduction Act and that legislation and how it affects uh, the EV future that we're talking about in General Motors specifically. Yeah, um, the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, I think is one of the most consequential pieces of legislation um, for General Motors. The clean energy title, um, has a significant amount of policy levers that um, help to advance EV adoption with consumers um, and relating the calculation for those EV incentives is actually a really innovative policy development in the United States. We've never had industrial policy before uh, in the U.S. What we find in the way the consumer incentives are constructed, and I'll talk about some of the other provisions in a second, but 
this is the first time where we have a policy undergirding a direction that drives uh, more investment in the United States, investment in manufacturing, investment in people, and investment in technology. Because uh, the, the, the future of mobility and the future of transportation is a, is a global race for technology, for resources. America has always been at the forefront, and General Motors, frankly, has always been at the forefront of transportation, technology, and innovation. And it's really important, and I think fantastic, that Congress uh, recognize that America continue, needs to continue to lead in this space. And that's what the IRA is at the end of the day. And that's what the clean energy title, uh, frankly, is all about. So, uh, Omar, as a taxpayer, why should I feel good about my tax dollars going into something like a clean energy uh, bill or Inflation Reduction Act, as the whole bill is called? Why, why should I feel good that that's a good investment? Right, because we're, we're um, or the government, uh, all of us are investing tax dollars into avenues that will continue to grow the economy and grow our communities. Um, and with that, you have a general uplifting. So, you know, I, I think it's, um, it's important to support policies that drive uh, economic growth, job growth, wage growth. And with that, we have the betterment of our communities. And I think that's a good thing at the end of the day. Can you tell us a little bit about the importance of the supply chain and how we're going to build resiliency into our supply chain? We've had great success so far uh, in, um, in helping our supply chain colleagues um, to execute on their strategy. Uh, legislation is an important part of that, like the CHIPS Act, uh, which we can talk about more. Uh, but it all comes together to ensure that uh, we have that uh, secured supply chain strategy. Maybe one last thought on that point is, look, one thing we've learned uh, over the past couple of years is that our supply chain cannot be left vulnerable to pandemics, uh, natural disasters, and geopolitics. And so uh, we're working hand-in-hand -hand with our colleagues in supply chain uh, to help ensure that uh, the policy environment supports our localization strategies. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the CHIPS Act and why did that matter and how you and your team again engaged to come up with a bipartisan solution? The CHIPS Act is a great example of these types of policies that um, help support our, our uh, sourcing strategy. Uh, uh, and, and I think CHIPS is also uh, reflective of a couple of things. One, you have a policy proposal that benefits uh, U.S. competitiveness, and that's really important, right? We can't advance a policy proposal that, oh, it just benefits GM only, right? Uh, Good public policy proposals have a higher chance of success. So CHIPS Act is, is, is one of those. Give me a perspective from a policy team member or policy team leader of 2023. What, what's important or where are our opportunities in 2023? Objective number one is to get to know the new elected leaders um, and, uh, and help them to understand our mission of zero crashes, zero emissions, and zero congestion. Uh, priority number two. In addition to uh, uh, the implementation of the clean energy title in the IRA, uh, we're focused on autonomous vehicle uh, legislation. Uh, for our uh, autonomous vehicle technology to grow and prosper, for our uh, investments uh, and partnership with crews um, to, to prosper and be successful, we need legislative changes. Our third element uh, from a legislative perspective um, is working on uh, the new sort of emerging businesses that we have at General Motors, uh, like GM Energy, important piece of it. And there's going to be a lot of regulatory work, legislative work around that business. And so, Omar, I thank you for taking time out and sharing your thoughts with us at the Competitive Advantage. I think the team here has gotten an appreciation for a business element that's important, even though it's not you know, directly in, inside of our plants. It has a huge effect on what we're able to do and what we're able to get done. So again, thanks and uh, welcome to General Motors. And thank you, Gerald, and thank you to the manufacturing organization. Fantastic partners, and we have a lot more to do together. Thanks, Omar. Stay safe. Thank you.